Bernard is the executive director of uh, Harvard University's Labor and Work Life Program, which is in the Harvard Law School. Um, although she's been in the United States for think, well over 20 years, uh, Elaine is one of us. She's Canadian. Uh, she uh, she um, was uh, uh, did her BA at the University of Alberta and her MA uh, at UBC and her PhD at Simon Fraser. Um, after I think a non-traditional path to post-secondary education. Um, which I think is one of the very admirable things about her and what I think connects her very strongly to workers uh, and their, their, you know, various experiences of education. Um, Canadian labor studies uh, nerds uh, like myself will know that her classic work, That Long Distance Feeling, A History of the Telecommunication Workers Union, uh, which was published by New Star Books in 1982, but of course since then Elaine has been a prolific writer, speaker, and labor educator uh, on the contemporary challenges facing the labor movement, both in the United States, Canada, and internationally. Um, she, as a labor educator, has been deeply involved with the Harvard Trade Union Program, which uh, brings uh, trade union leadership to Harvard to do the kind of deep, critical and labor studies education that we know our, our unions need. Um, and of course, she has conducted workshops with unions from all around the world. She is much in demand as a speaker. Um, her research interests focus on workers and technological change, comparative labor movements, the role of unions in civil society and democratic life. Uh, but this is a very small sample of uh, her interests and areas of expertise. Um, I'll take a moment to, um, before I say one last thing about Elaine, to say that the, this plenary is uh, generously sponsored by Brock University's Social Science or so, Social Justice Research Institute, uh, at, which is a very important new hub of transdisciplinary research on social justice issues. They have a number of uh, sub areas: uh, jobs and justice, uh, uh, epistemological justice, animals and justice, and what's the one? and gender. Uh, and of course, it's very important to support uh, the development of research spaces on social justice issues in our universities. Um, I know myself at York University, we've struggled hard to create and maintain similar kinds of bodies. So I encourage you all to look at the Social Justice Research Institute's website uh, and become involved in, uh, and knowledgeable about their, their projects and activities. So let me say one last thing about uh, Elaine, taken from her Wikipedia entry, and I think it's a good way to frame, sorry, way to way frame her in her comments. Shame on you, Stephanie. I'm not plagiarizing it, at least, because like most of us. So it says that Bernard's primary reputation, however, is as a public speaker. She is provocative and blunt and has been known to pleasantly shock audiences with her <laughs> off-color language. Bernard often takes the American labor movement to task for not being aggressive enough in pushing its agenda, too willing to couch its opinions and conclusions in objective language, and for not engaging in strategic thinking. All very good things, I think. As Bernard herself has stated, her prescription is for the American labor movement to be bold, to be explicit, be as loyal to labor as the business school is to business. Be audacious. Such statements, as well as her skills as an orator, have made her much sought after as a panelist and public speaker. And all of this is very true and precisely why we invited her to deliver the first ever calls keynote on the topic of work, labor, democracy, searching for the next labor movement. So please join me in welcoming Elaine Bernard. Wow, that's scary. <laughs> you really got to watch out for Google and Wikipedia. Uh, a few years ago, they had me down on one of them as a, as a quasi-Marxist. And a colleague looked it up and said, oh, you've got to change that. I said, yeah, quasi? <laughs> uh, uh, first, I want to congratulate everyone here, and particularly though those folks who are in calls, the Canadian Association for Work and Labor Studies. I think it's first a very exciting thing, as someone who's been a labor educator for over 30 years, uh, I, I know too well the experience of going to 
US labor education meetings and being on the Canada panel, where we do little things on Canada and get a lot of jokes about pronouncing it progress instead of progress, and deep thinking things like that. <laughs> uh, or going to other parts of the uh, humanities where we get to do maybe a labor panel with the uh, political economists or uh, God help us occasionally even with the labor economists or the sociologists. But never feeling we really have a home. And also feeling that we're special, not just because we really are serious about multidisciplinary studies, but also we're serious about engaging folks who are doing things in labor and work, that we respect people whose learning is not maybe the normal, formal, academic road. That was certainly my case. You notice they don't call me a high school dropout, which they should. Instead, it says the non-traditional road. Uh, so it's, I think that makes labor studies very important. But I want to push a little beyond that. This is very unique because this is the first time we're bringing together Canadian labor studies. I want you to think a little bit about that. Think in particular because it forces us to start to say, is there something special about the Canadian labor movement that maybe we should start talking about? We should start thinking and researching about. And then what I would urge you is don't just keep it in Canada. Because I actually think there is some very valuable and important insights and experience of the Canadian labor movement, of organizing workers in Canada, of social movements and the social justice struggles in Canada that while grows out of a specific environment, has real legs and lessons for other people. And so we need to think a little bit about that. And a key way of doing that is starting by actually coming together, forming an organization. You know, we teach organizing, we just don't do it. But now, of course, with calls, we're starting to do it. And if I can make one last plug, I'd urge everybody to join calls. It's very inexpensive. In fact, we just reduced the price by half. Uh, that's an inside joke, because originally you joined for two years, now you only joined for one year, and so we reduced the price. Um, specifically, and everybody here, and maybe I'll open, you know, I'm not going to talk, uh, I won't take up all the available oxygen. I'm going to make sure that we got a lot of time to talk. But if I was just listing a bunch of things that I think make the Canadian labor and social justice environment sort of a little different, I'd have to look at our women's movement. And maybe I notice it by running into a lot of other women's movements. One of the things I noticed is Canadian women's movement actually has always had a very strong working class uh, consciousness within it and has had working class women within it, often in leadership roles. And that may seem sort of, isn't that obvious? No, it isn't. No, it isn't. When you look at the women's movement in many other countries, we often, uh, uh, and, and so looking at also how the women's movement inside the labor movement has influenced the labor movement. Whether it's, uh, just see in the paper again today, we're back on the issues of choice and abortion. Uh, whether it's how we think about pay equity. <coughs> whether it's issues that uh, we have in the past until the women's movement not viewed as workers' issues such as child care. Uh, uh, how we thought about the unpaid work and whether it needs to be paid. All of these are issues that are part and parcel of labor thinking that was brought in by the, the women's movement. Also, of course, the whole area of equity. And it starts with equity on gender, but then very quickly it switches to what about sexual orientation? What about First Nations? What about racialized people? And a lot of that starts with the power of the women's movement inside the labor movement that first, I like to say, we uh, 
the door open, but then we rolled up the welcome rug, stuck it in the door, and made sure that lots of other folks can come in. Uh, the Quebec labor movement, come on, that makes this part of geography very, very unique. Is there another labor movement in the world, maybe the Belgian labor movement, a few others, where you actually have, within a single nation state, a sort of recognition that there is a nation within the nation that we recognize and we treat totally different than any other, you know, the Quebec Federation of Labor isn't just another federation of labor. Uh, and so thinking about how the Quebec fact has really influenced the labor movement and again, how we think about social justice. And boy, uh, the Maple Spring, the student movement in Quebec, uh, much to my embarrassment, I go places and talk a little bit about it, and people are saying, wow, never heard of that. Never heard of that. Can you imagine if Maple Spring happened in some location in the United States? Nobody would have heard of it? Hell no, they'd be doing a mini-series on it right now. <laughs> Downton students, right, coming this fall. Uh, it, incredible. Uh, the, uh, and, and what an exciting movement, what an exciting movement that, you know, brought down a government. Normally we hear, boy, you know, be careful what you do, you might bring down a government. And uh, uh, very, very exciting. And of course, raises all sorts of issues. Are they workers? Are they incentive <coughs> workers? How does the workers' movement relate to this? Uh, uh, labor education. Labor <laughs> education in Canadian unions is very different than labor education in a whole lot of other areas. First, uh, I love to startle people by saying, do you know the Canadian labor movement actually has a methodology of labor education? They, the degree to which we're successful or not depends but we actually believe in popular education, we believe in the theory of Paulo Ferreira, and that's the way we try to do labor education within the Canadian labor movement. Well, that's pretty startling. That's a very different, again, something others can learn from. The variety of organizations we have under that term union or association. We've historically had unions that were uh, sort of anti-union unions sponsored by the Catholic Church, the Confederation of, Free, the Confederation of uh, Catholic Trade Unions that then in the 60s with the Quiet Revolution became the SASN, which, uh, to, you know, and then we've also had other unions linked to religious organizations that I will not mention. Uh, but, but at least looking at the tremendous variety of, of types of unions out there. Industrial unions, we had industrial unions in Canada back when industrial unions in many other countries were not possible. I'm thinking of the uh, CBRE, named Brotherhood of Railway Employees. Back at the turn of the century, we were successful at building a national, a Canadian national trade union, which also, of course, raises the issue We've had international unions in Canada. Now, international unions in Canada is an odd term. It usually means US-centered uh, unions. But we've done that. And today, there's an attempt to, is it possible to have unions, meaningful unions, across borders? I think, in particular, the steel workers in Canada and the United States have now made formal membership with workers in the Union Unite in the UK. And they're looking at what does it mean to have people be actually members of a union in other countries? How far can we go with this? What is the meaning? Um, we've had professional and still have professional organizations, professional unions, uniquely Canadian unions. And hey, even, even in relatively recent history, we had feminist unions. When I was in British Columbia, we had a terrific union called Sorwak that was a women's feminist union. It let men in, but it was explicitly a feminist union. And many of the things that they did, uh, which was organize women workers that other unions weren't maybe as interested in, uh, 
eventually provoked other unions to recognize women workers. And today, of course, the majority of the workforce, uh, the unionized membership in Canada is female. Again, that's a little different. That's not true in most places in Europe. It's not true yet in the United States. That, again, makes the Canadian labor environment very different. So I think uh, and the last one is co-ops and uh, worker ownership. That's always been a very strong tradition in this country. Again, we've got a lot of experience in that area and needs to be looked at and talked about. Well, generally, as you know, I, I, I'm living in the U.S. and I'm sort of interested that when the U.S. labor dreams in technicolor, like, you know, way out there, blue ocean strategies and I see what we're calling it at the Congress, big thinking. Uh, <laughs> when they dream, and there's a recent article in the New York Times, you know, the American dream is now called Canada. Uh, they think of Canadian labor. They think as recently as uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the major <coughs> demands for labor law reform in the US, the big new thing, was called the Employee Free Choice Act. And it was, in fact, just three components that already exist in most Canadian jurisdictions. Card check, uh, uh, certification, that is, getting the majority of workers to sign union cards and automatically having that workforce certified as the sole bargaining agent. It was uh, uh, first contract arbitration, that is, when you me impasse over organizing or negotiating a first contract, uh, there would be an arbitrated first contract, and then increased penalties for employers engaging in anti-union activity. That was the big dream in the U.S., all of which exists in many jurisdictions in Canada. By the way, in the U.S., it completely failed. It completely failed. Uh, but it does beg the question, I would say, what do we dream of? When Canadian labor dreams in technicolor, when we dream about a different, uh, uh, what, what do we dream of? Well, not you and me, but I've noticed when Canadian conservative dreams, they dream US. And we're already seeing this. All of a sudden, we're seeing a tax on the RAND formula which is that uh, long held, uh, uh, now incorporated into legislation model that once a union is certified as the sole bargaining agent, everybody pays in and everybody receives services uh, for that. Um, they're talking about right to work, which is right to work for less, basically union busting. Uh, so it does beg the question, uh, what, what is our dream? What is our dream? It certainly can't be the, the, the US, but is it just uh, uh, a little bit more of what we've already got? Let's return to what we won uh, uh, 40 years ago. Let's hold on to what previous generations have won for us. And the reason I raise this is because at this moment in history, um, we're at a very, very tricky point. Not only because of the attacks that we're seeing on our existing regime of labor rights, but also I would point out that Canada, again, is very unique. I'm in a privileged situation of traveling to many countries, and when I look at other advanced industrial countries, I just got an email today, the, US, uh, the UK is down to 12.6% union density. For the last decade, by the way, Canada's been at about 30% union density. People in Europe, people in Australia, people in the UK, they want to, you know, when they find that out, they say, well, what's going on here? How come that is the case? That's not the case in the US. It's now down to uh, 12, 11% of the workforce. It's not the case in the UK. It's not the case in Australia. What's happening in Canada? What's the story <coughs> here? But so often, because we look at the US, we spend a lot of time saying, well, 
you know, almost like the convergence thesis. Well, we're going the same way, but just a little slower. But is that really the Canadian story? I don't think so. I don't think so for some of the reasons I've mentioned. But also, I would argue we need to get more of the story out. We need to understand it. Because if you believe, as I do, that's not the story, then let's find out what the story is. But secondly, don't just stick with that story. Because what I'm really interested in is the next labor movement. Because we are, right now, creating the next labor movement. Right now, what we're seeing is the defensive side of it, holding on to what we got. But I like to think that you've got to use that 30% today to empower a dream about the next labor movement and what it should look like. Now, we know the forces we're facing. We know about globalization and the intensive uh, uh, competition, international, uh, uh, political, and economic integration. We know about financialization and the transformation of our economies that used to be about uh, goods, uh, the production of goods and services, and now simply the, you know, the tail, finance, which is that small entity within an economy who, if you like, greases the skins of production to make the production of goods, services, and caregiving possible, now, now starts to rule the economy. We've seen that happen. We've seen the change in the organization of work and our labor laws, which were written in a period of the 1930s and 40s, still uh, read as if you're going to stand outside of big plants with uh, 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 leaflets and come join the union. Uh, the change in the actual work base uh, of employment, the change of employers and how you are employed, the rise of the precariat, the um, uh, uh, growing forms of, of new forms of employment, which are all of which put more and more responsibility onto uh, the individuals. And finally, of course, the hostility, hostility, growing hostility of employers, which include, of course, one of the largest employers, which is, of course, uh, uh, government. So, so really, it's a time where we can think again about the future of work, about, and, and think about the future of work is work is probably one of the single most important connections that citizens and residents have to a society. It's one of the major ways in which, and still the most important way, within which we redistribute the wealth of a society to its citizens. Historically, in labor, we sort of understood that there were actually two parts of it. One was the wage you earned by working. The second was the social wage that you received simply as being a resident or a citizen in a country. And what we've seen is increasingly the carving away of the social wage, the notion that the only wage should be the wage you earn by working in more and more precarious jobs with fewer and fewer social wages. Uh, and golly gee, you're on your own. And so part of the history of the Canadian labor movement was in fact, and of social justice, was building a social wage, which now of course is being labeled the nanny state, instead of my right to some of the wealth uh, and the production of, of this society. Uh, whether I work in paid labor or unpaid labor that help to build the, the next generation of workers, the next generation of citizens. So thinking some of those, going back, if you like, the first principle, back to some of those basic ideas about who we are as labor, who we are as citizens, who we are as residents, and starting to, again, start to think those big thoughts, not just let's hold on to what we've got, but let's use it or lose it. And that means rethinking work. It also means rethinking the future of democracy. Uh, I guess a lot of us, I include myself, I always thought naively 
until the War Measures Act, uh, that democracy would disappear with a sort of bang that, you know, uh, uh, the War Measures Act was a good lesson and that, you know, it was with the bang all of a sudden there's, you know, uh, armed guards on Parliament Hill. <laughs> and, yeah, that, that was pretty impressive. That's the way I always thought democracy disappeared. I never thought it would disappear by growing concentrations of wealth and the growing of the 1% and the money and the wealth and the concentration of wealth starting to dominate all of politics. Uh, and, you know, the sort of difference between um, if you put a frog in a burning, uh, in a boiling pot, it jumps out. But if you slowly turn the heat up, you cook the frog and it never quite knew what was happening. And I think what we're seeing is the disappearance of democracy in our society through the concentration of wealth and with wealth, power. Again, a big issue. What is our role? Because and that comes down to what is the dream of labor? Um, among the many bad things I've ever been called, I was once called a social democrat. Uh, and I'm not a social democrat, uh, but I do like to think a little bit about parties. I do like to think a little bit about government. I think, historically, labor movements had to ask a very simple question. What are you in it for? Do you want to simply get a little bit more money in this workplace, maybe have a little bit better, or are you into transformation of society? Do you believe working people should have a voice in the running of society, or is it just, you know, know your place? Historically, labor movements have created or worked with political parties. Some, in some cases, they've created parties. In other cases, they were. But the creation or the involvement in those parties, again, Canada has a really interesting history in that. We sort of did it. We weren't quite sure. We argued about it. We had unions that didn't believe in independent labor political action. They believed in the American model of reward your friends and penalize your enemies and do it from time to time. We've had parties, uh, unions that believe in strategic voting, which is a slightly <coughs> different version of reward your friends and penalize your enemies. We've had unions that have argued, well, we need our own party. And even more recently, we said, well, our party's abandoned us, so maybe we need to create a new party, which is a good idea. Except you better figure out how to deal with the party. You can't deal with the one you got. What are you going to do with the one you're about to create to make sure that it doesn't disappear? <laughs> That's not just a Canadian problem, by the way. That's an international problem of labor political action, asking the question of what do we want? I've often said a strength of labor in politics is that it forces working people through their unions to start to think about ruling. Ruling is very important. Ruling is about not just how I relate to this employer, how I lobby my masters, but how someday working people will in fact be the government and govern on behalf of all of us. And when we do that, we're going to have to do compromises. And what will it look? How will we make sure that it's a real just government? A just government <laughs> that includes the wide inclusions, uh, that it respects minority rights, that it really is something. Well, that's not something you normally debate for a whole long time in a union hall. So one of the ways you get into those types of questions is through political action. Now the problem is the difference between maybe social democracy and a wider notion of labor political action is I think people make mistakes sometimes when you elect a party that that party, if it's from the workers, is in power. I hear that all the time. Oh, we elected a government, they're in power. Nonsense, capital is in power. Uh, but the best you can do is that you can rule and you can use the vehicles of government 
to try and change power relationships. So you're not in government, or you're not in power, you're in government. But that requires us to think one of those big thoughts. What would we do? What do we dream about when we dream in technicolor? Do we dream about a different labor regime? Or is it like PC 1003, the Wagner Act, exclusive representation, only more? Does the current labor law, will it ever serve home care workers in a meaningful way? Will some of the poorest workers in this country ever, ever be able to unionize as exclusive bargaining units uh, and negotiate collective agreements? And if they did, would any of our unions ever really want them? Think about it. No, it requires us to start to look at different models. And maybe models that start to say, hey, in Germany, if five or more employees get together, the employer must call them together. Those employees do get to vote on representation, and they create a works council that is empowered with all sorts of rights. Uh, but they don't have the right to strike. They don't, yeah, 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 yeah. But do we need a regime that starts to say, workers' rights are fundamental to democracy. We're losing our democracy. We need to start building it. Do we need to start looking at things like broader sector representation? And that is, uh, those of you who've heard me before, I've joked about, we have special rules in Canadian and US labor law that permits blue collar workers, in particular craft workers, to form sectoral organizations and to pull employers together in a single table and to take workers who are not represented by the union to organize them and to pull their employer into a sectoral agreement. Well, that's terrific. So we have one set of rules for boy unions. Well, what about girls? <laughs> what about women workers? Couldn't we do such a similar type of thing? What would it look like? And the nice thing about that type of craft union is historically they have transformed industry. They have become, in a world of growing precarious, and is there anybody more precarious than a construction worker? They're constantly working a job, finishing it, walking away, working another one. How come unions have figured out a way and we have laws that permit them to bring stability to very precarious workers and allow them to retire with dignity, maybe we need similar type organizations. I look at sports and entertainment law where we have uh, collective agreements and individual contracts. In fact, there's a lot of models out there. Again, is this how we could start to think big and think about a next labor movement, the type of structures that would make it possible? And then who would, who would be in it? What are the problems workers face? Who are the workers who will never, under our current regime, ever be able to have the rights that other workers have? And what would it take to help organize them into organizations? It really requires us to actually get back to a lot of first principles. I'm going to push you to think about also linking with other organizations to go to the developing world, to go to Asia, to go to, because they ask questions that we need to be asking. One of the best ones I ever had is I was invited to teach a small course on collective <coughs> bargaining in Guangzhou, a uh, historic <coughs> canton. And you know, collective bargaining, I could do that in my sleep. One of the first questions by one of the cadre was, uh, how do you figure out demands? I said, what do you mean? How do you figure out what to ask for? It led to a fantastic discussion that we almost never had when we talked about the collective bargaining. Uh, back to first principles. It also means getting out and, and using our examples that come out of our very specific experience and seeing to what extent they might have legs in other areas. Well, Alexis de Tocqueville, a Frenchman who came and visited North America some 60 years after the American Revolution, noted something about, and I would say, North Americans. 
He said that in democratic countries, the knowledge of how to combine is the mother of all forms of knowledge. On its progress depends that of all others. I thought when I read that, that this notion of the knowledge of how to combine is one of the most powerful things that unions do, that we actually are the guardians and hopefully the promoters and hopefully the sharers of the knowledge of how to combine, which is absolutely vital in today's world. And so it's exciting times in Canada for a labor movement, for social justice movement, but it demands that we again think about this knowledge of how to combine. In face of attacks uh, from a political right, and think again about uh, uh, not just combining in defense, but combining to think about what the next labor movement would look like. Now I've noticed there's some very exciting things happening. We're now publishing in Canada over the last two years a number of papers and articles in anticipation of these attacks on RAND formula, on right to work, which are basically going back to first principle and say, what do unions do? Why are unions? I would argue, though, they tend to be ones that first say, what unions do for their members? That's very good. That's very useful. It's particularly useful for young people who are coming up who find themselves in unions and uh, uh, no knowledge of where it came from. So that's good. The second one is that we often, we're now expanding it to say, what do unions do for society? And with that, we're looking at beyond their own members. Uh, this is the social justice unions. This is, heck, if you have a, if you are in a strongly unionized sector, whether you're in a union or not, you get a union wage premium for that sector. We know that. But I think you actually need, and this is going to sound funny coming from me, but I think we need to spend a little bit of time numbering the third one, too, which is what unions do for employers. We're always getting hammered about that somehow we're the enemy. Uh, if you look at what unions do as far as aggregating worker demand, even at the level of firm, that is a tremendous asset to an employer. They don't fully appreciate it. They think they can do it better through human resources. But truthfully, it's way better. Everything you're saying in management <coughs> literature basically almost begs for a union. And I think we gotta, we gotta, we gotta throw those contradictions at them. The other thing we've got to do is talk a little bit more, and one of the insights I've had recently is, uh, I, I spend too long with economists, but economists have a wonderful understanding of a particular type of entity which they call experienced goods. And these are items that you can't really know the value of, uh, by looking at it, doesn't really, can't smell it, touch it, it's, it's not on an open market so you can value it, etc. You have to experience it to appreciate it. And it really occurred to me, that's unions. That's the knowledge of how to combine. You have to experience it and then you can look back and say, oh yeah, that's what it's about. Think about it as, as uh, 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 solidarity and collective action. You can read about it, but you don't get that charge, that adrenaline, that feeling, that real understanding until you've actually done it. And unions are, in fact, experience good. So let me go through one other example or experience of Canadians. When I'm in other countries, I'll often say to a union audience, who here has joined the labor movement through organizing? That is, they went to work in a non-union place, they went through an organizing experience, and they formed a union. And generally, in an audience of trade union leaders, if I get five or six people, I'm, I'm startled. I know I'm in a unionized, you know, great organizing environment. In many other countries, I'll also ask, who here has ever been on strike? And the reason I use on strike is because whether it's going on strike or whether it's 
organizing. It's a very similar experience to the extent to which you are forced to take a risk. Talk to your coworkers. Uh, think about, well, you know, you can afford this. You, you've got a working spouse. I don't. What about my kids? And will I do this? Will I go with them? Or will I just be quiet and go back to work? Should I do this? It's a tremendous uh, uh, moment where you make a decision and a commitment. And what's very interesting about the Canadian labor movement, by the way, and again, an anomaly, not just that 30%, but if you look at, uh, I've done this with thousands of Canadian workers, Overwhelmingly, whether it's the public sector, the private sector, teachers, whatever, they all put their hands up. We have been a very striking labor movement. So that, if you want, that a lot of the existing labor movement in Canada has gone through not an organizing experience, because frankly we haven't been organizing uh, to the extent to which we should, but we have been striking. And if you look at some of the attacks on the labor movement today, they're very carefully aimed, legislative back to work, increasing who is now a uh, essential service worker. They're really aimed at demobilizing labor and preventing a new generation of Canadian workers from having gone through the experience, that galvanizing moment of experienced goods. That, I think, reminds us and warns us about the next labor movement can't just be a labor movement designed by architects and lawyers and others to, you know, so that, you know, so it looks like the uh, loading up the art. We've got two of everything and all look, but that it's actually an action-based organization and we make the road by walking and it's going to be uh, and, and probably by picketing a fair amount too. So this notion of experience, good, and and uh, 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 and why the current attacks, by the way, matter, and why action against them. I like to think of what's going to happen in Quebec. Think about Maple Spring and the Quebec students. That action was important beyond anything they won. Uh, 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 but it was an action not only that starts off with their own particular interest, narrow, about, you know, don't increase fees, we're students, and then it grows to, no, no, this is a narrative about austerity and about making people pay, including us students. This is a narrative about building solidarity beyond just students. This is a, so, this is a narrative about what sort of society do we want to be in Quebec? What is the role of education? What is the role of austerity? And then the knowledge that they went from class to class, organizing, debating, arguing, and then taking mass action successfully. Won't that be a fun group of workers <laughs> moving into the workplace that have already had the experience of experience good? And that tells us a story about the next labor movement. How do we make sure that the next labor movement is actually helping workers, students, interns, home workers, unworkers, retired workers, non workers, experiencing this experience good of solidarity, of taking direct action? How do we start to grow the next? labor movement, in fact, through uh, collective action. So I've always maintained the best way to predict the future is to create it, but what does it mean? What type of future? And I guess that's where finally those of us in uh, labor studies need to push a little the labor movement so that when we're thinking the big picture of the future, that it's a future uh, and that labor has a major role to play in talking about the environment. Uh, if we look at where there are clashes between the social justice movement and the labor movement, and sometimes the labor movement isn't quite where it should be with the social justice movement, it's often on issues of the environment. Uh, and hey, on environmental issues, guess what? A lot of workers are the canaries in the mine. So thinking about how we build you know, uh, worker and, and social justice in, 
a solidarity, and the next labor movement needs to be a labor movement that is green, that is fully committed to saving the substance of our life, which is the environment. It's a labor movement of equality, and uh, equality um, uh, cannot take place with concentrations of wealth and power. So we got to move equality beyond the very narrow version of equal pay for equal work to equal rights of citizens and residents to have some of the fruits of the wealth of this country. And uh, uh, the Newfoundlanders had a great one. Uh, one of the big shocks for me was when Newfoundland became a have province from a have not province. I had a whole pile of jokes I just had to get rid of. Uh, but in fairness, the Newfoundlanders uh, last year and the year before had a great campaign. A have province needs a have people. Well, Canada, a have country needs a have people. Uh, it means inclusion, and inclusion in uh, 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 not just uh, in the most narrow sense, but inclusion beyond the very narrow version of who is a worker. It means action. It means the next labor movement and this labor movement. It, it's going to be created by, we make the road by walking, by action. And it's going to be one where our definition of who is a worker needs to be greatly expanded. Greatly expanded to, I like to think everybody's a worker. Either an incipient worker, an unrecognized worker, uh, but a worker. And then finally, it's got to be globalized. And by that, uh, one of the major issues we have is dealing with relations uh, internationally. And there, I think, historically, again, our labor movement has tended to be, it's both a movement and an institution. And the institution has silly rules that get in the way of building the movement. Uh, and there's, thank God we've got sociologists, because there's endless literature about this in sociology. But it's thinking about how do we start to, yeah, we need to build at the international level. But how do we start to, because the international global labor movement has come home. It's in all of our class. When you look around, who are the workers? They have relationships <coughs> with other countries. They have worker colleagues in other places. They have experience and knowledge. How do we start to bring that, not just at the highest levels, where yes, it's important, but down actually to the level of the plant, to the level of the workplace, to the level of where uh, care is uh, given and produced. So it's that type of thing that I think uh, 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 changes globalization from just being about them versus us, but out actually says, hey, it's, it's a very different world, but it's a world that globalization isn't about them and us, it's the world now, again, the Canadian experience, amongst one of the most highly uh, uh, countries with one of the highest rates of um, immigration. So is there a story there of the Canadian labor movement that's very different than many other countries that we've been able to succeed in? So let me end by saying we make the road by walking, but we better figure out soon where we're walking to. Thank you. Yeah.